What's up, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. It's super early, so I don't, I, I'm, I'm like kind of whispering a little bit, so I'm gonna give you guys a sexy voice up on the mic, but let me know if you guys can or cannot hear me. Today, we're gonna be talking about Andrew Yang's recent tweets. If these had been sweatshop workers in Asia making goods in US consumers, it would have sparked an international response. Now, basically, of course, he's referring to the tweet below, which is that nine cabbies or drivers have killed themselves recently in uh, New York City, largely because of financial stress. There is no question that there is an, uh, just a ridiculous amount of stress on New York City cab drivers as a result of these, uh, as a result of automation indirectly through Uber, Lyft, um, their new business model. Low key, <laughs> it might even not even be low key, and extremely high key, uh, bad, policy. I'm going to hop into this initial article uh, and it's coming from the Inquisitor. Uh, well, back in 2018, Yang tweeted high suicides, um, record drug overdoses, crumbling marriage rates, crazy college debt, lower social ties, and even rising racial and gender divisions. GDP is higher than ever, but it is clear something has gone wrong in our economy. If you're familiar with Andrew Yang, you know that he's running on uh, universal basic income, but the reason that the policy is even really coming to the forefront of the discussion these days is because of automation, the rise of AI, the rise of uh, the rise of the machine. <laughs> Perhaps you've heard. Yeah, basically, um, you know, companies are getting more efficient. They're getting leaner. They figured out, hey, we don't need all these people. Why don't we just, you know, instead of outsourcing, which outsourcing was was for a while, you know, globalization that was part of it. Now they're like, no, we don't even need to do that. We can just get some really sophisticated robots or, or AI, and they can do a lot of the things that we need them to do. And we don't even need employees. Just uh, a problem that's that's growing, and it's growing now at a rate that's that's too fast to really slow down, uh, if we want to at least be competitive. This uh, post article: Lyft driver found dead in the back of car. Um, as cabbie suicide epidemic continues, as I said, this would be number nine. A man whose name was not immediately released ingested or breathed in some kind of substance in the backseat of his Hyundai Sonata at Myrtle Avenue and 75th Street on the side of Mount Lebanon Cemetery in Glendale around 4 a.m., police said. He'd been a Lyft driver since 2014. According to a TLC spokesman, he was pronounced dead on scene. Later that uh, later in the morning, cops removed the man from the he uh, car head first, laid him down on his back. His face was covered with a white powder from the forehead down, and his right hand was bent upwards from the elbow. I really can't even imagine what that looks like, but uh, it sounds awful. He wore a black bubble jacket, gray argyle sweater, jeans, black socks, no shoes. A bottle of pills was found on the ground near the car. Cops could not confirm whether he worked for worked as a for-hire driver, and the TLC was looking into the incident Saturday afternoon. Um, I'm just going to kind of skip down here. Many drivers blame the suicide epidemic on the meteor meteoric growth of rideshare companies such as Lyft and Uber, which has pinched everyone's pocketbooks. Now, to give you guys a little bit of background, I'm going to have to jump ahead a little bit because it'll tie this up with you guys like, whoa, whoa, whoa Andrew Yang, what were we talking about cabs before? In 2013, under Mayor Michael Bloomberg, which name, the name sounds super familiar right now. Yeah, yeah, that, that same guy who's running for president now? He tried to step in and address a growing problem in New York City for there not being enough cabs to get people to certain destinations. So he proposed these uh, green, I think they're called green taxis. Okay, the mayor wants to allow up to 18,000 livery cars to begin offering street hail service in areas that are underserved by the existing fleet of 13,287 yellow cabs. Most taxis now do virtually all of their business at the city airports and in Manhattan's business and nightlife districts. Basically, he, uh, he basically pushed this hail act, which passed in several legislative initiatives in Albany in 2011, 2012, had been bitterly opposed by owners of yellow cab medallions. They say that allowing liveries to stop for customers on the street threatens both their business and the value of the medallions, which can now sell for more than a million dollars apiece, which is absolutely insane. But it's also absolutely the result of poor government policy. We are at an interesting juncture, right? The, the conversation for people is, man, jobs are, are going to the wayside. There's automation speeding up. And some people kind of default to, well, things will get better, right? Things will get better because it's like outsourcing. Truck driver became an extremely popular job because of globalization. Some would argue that this is what happens when you let the government interfere with private business, and you know what, that's respectable. But at the same time, 
you know, you guys open this Pandora's bar box. It's too late now. <laughs> you know, it's, it's too late now. And uh, as a result, um, we, we have a competitive edge that seems to be slipping and enter the fourth industrial revolution where we might, you know, actually have some real trouble competing globally if we don't do something now. Enter Andrew Yang, who wants to give every American $1,000 a month in preparation for this tsunami of job loss. Crumbling marriage rates, college debt, lower social ties. These are all a result of, you know, a society that's kind of unraveling. Because despite record GDP, you're seeing these things affect our society. So the question has to be asked, how do you want to measure society? Does it just want to be based on financial success or does the quality of the life of the citizens matter at all? I'm gonna jump over here because I really want to give you guys some more foundation on this because again, you might still be wondering like, how does this tie into everything? This uh, from Real Clear Policy, which gives a really good background of how we got into this mess in the first place. So this is by Abigail Narb from March 2019. The New York City municipal government has spent the last 80 years claiming to protect drivers' livelihood, but this has actually been waging a war on their ability to earn income. Unfortunately, it's taken the suicide of eight taxi drivers in 2018 to make the city realize that its approach is, isn't working. Since 1937, the New York City government has kept the number of taxi medallions government permission slips, or government permission slips, to operate a yellow cab in the city at a fixed number. Even as the city's population jumped from around 7 million to over 8.5 million, the number of cabs remained constant at 13,587. As the demand for taxis grew even higher, the value of medallion reached outrageous heights. At the Taxi Peaks bubble in 2014, a medallion cost $1.3 million. Let's not forget, many companies get incredibly wealthy off of government programs, off of government subsidies, off of government intervention. And then these are the same companies that are telling you to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You know, you need to get it together. This is that government welfare we're talking about. These companies are literally, or at least at one point, were completely propped up by the fact that the government was limiting the amount of medallions that were available uh, for use at a time. Do you think Yellow Cab had a problem with medallions at that point? Were they complaining? You know, we got too much money because the government stepped in in, in 1937 and started regulating this industry. They had nothing to say. And then when Uber and Lyft came and they decided, hey, we got a better idea, better way to do this, this whole business model, they wanted the politicians to step in on their behalf. If a driver can't find his way to finance this purchase, he can't drive a taxi. Imagine having to pay $1.3 million in order to begin your job, believing that it would be a safe investment. Many cabbies paid out their life savings or took out cosmic loans to secure this token. Now, by the way, this is such a big topic that as you listen to it, I want you to remember, Bernie Sanders is proposing both a federal jobs guarantee, right? He wants to eliminate uh, 2.6 health, private health care jobs, 2.6 million health care jobs. Um, he has nothing, nothing for automation, by the way. He's not really worried about that right now. He also wants to put all this power into the hands of the government, who, as we can see, has limited innovation in this one particular sector, propped up a specific business model, a specific set of companies. And then when it was uh, time to pay the piper because, you know, automation came and they found a better way and they didn't step in early enough to stop Uber and Lyft through their, uh, their use of AI and, and technology, they had nothing for them. So what's the future in a world where we have a federal jobs guarantee and we don't have a government that really functions the best way possible? It's full of bureaucracy, wastes a lot of money. The price for a medallion has dropped over a million dollars in the past five years. A medallion's now hover for around 200,000. I actually have this article up that they're auctioning off, uh, what is it, 139. 139 taxi medallions are gonna be offered, uh, are gonna be auctioned off, and the prices have plunged uh, between 160,000 and $250,000. Uh, remember, we just talked about how they were valued at up to 1.3 million. And I bet a lot of people held those on, or a lot of companies held on to those, because they were just like, man, we're just going to experience this, this exponential growth forever until technology. Enter ride-sharing apps. Have you ever been in Midtown or Rainy Day or tried to hail a cab on the street in Brooklyn, Queens, or the Bronx? You know why New, York's, uh, New Yorkers are tired of waiting for familiar yellow cars. Uber and Lyft found a way to answer the needs of New Yorkers in a way that is inflexible, that an inflexible taxi system could not, and New Yorkers began to use the ride-sharing apps instead. I mean, again, there's two ways to look at this. We can look at it as, 
well, wow, if the government hadn't uh, created this, this situation by you know, enforcing these medallions, maybe we could have had Uber and Lyft sooner. Maybe we would have addressed this problem earlier on. But we didn't because the government is slow to react. The private sector is far better at reacting to opportunity than the government is. New York wages war on ride-sharing apps by capping the number of cars allowed to offer rides to New, York, uh, New Yorkers, creating a high minimum wage for app-based drivers, and heaping growing taxes and fines onto platform-based rides. Mayor de Blasio took to Twitter, blaming Twitter or <laughs> blaming Uber and Lyft for taxi industry problems. The unchecked growth of app base for hire vehicle companies has demanded action, and now we have it. The tweet went out right after the city council approved higher minimum wages and restrictions on the number of Ubers in New York City. He follows an unimaginative line of public figures who wrongfully place the blame on New York drivers' plight on competition instead of the uneven playing field that New Yorkers or New York's government forced taxis to play on. And this is what we're talking about, right? I love this fact that we're able to talk about all of these different things, all as a result of automation, bad public policy, and there's only one candidate in this entire race who's looking to address all of those things. His name is Andrew Yang. I want to say Andrew J. I don't know what his middle name is, but I feel like there should be a J in there. It just seems very presidential. So Councilman Rodriguez and Diaz sought a way to end the medallion madness, but their fix doesn't address the root problem. By offering to buy out taxi medallion owners, they're merely emulating the disastrous bailouts of the 2008 financial crisis, which left the faults of regulators and entrenched businesses unrecognized. And taxpayers, unhappy as they paid for others' mistakes, Oh, and taxpayers unhappy they left paid for others' mistakes. Furthermore, the federal courts have already ruled on the issue in the Seventh Circuit, as Justice Richard Posner said in a unanimous decision against bailing out taxi drivers. Property doesn't include a right to free from competition. He's right, of course. Taxi drivers are free to buy their own, buy and own a medallion, but their medallion doesn't entitle them to a monopoly. That's such an interesting thing because, literally, by the government's own creation. They should have been entitled to a monopoly. If there was no technology, then there, there, nothing would have changed. It would have, that would have been it. That would have been the only business model. New York's local government has positioned itself as an opponent to pro progress and innovation during what could have been an era of massive growth for taxis in New York City. Now, cab drivers and their passengers alike are hurting from regulations. A less restrictive economic environment in New York could offer hope to future drivers. What if properly vetted drivers could pursue a low-cost way to enter the market, give rides to millions of new workers, who, New Yorkers who are rushing from place to place? The past five years should have taught New York's, uh, New York's government a tough lesson, but they still haven't learned, and for that, the city is paying the price. Remove city, put in America. How many industries do you think that this is affecting? This, this whole idea of the government propped up a particular set of companies because of public policy. Angie Yang is the only one who's talking about this. He's not only is the only one talking about this, he's the only one who actually has policies. You guys know Angie Yang is talking freedom dividend, $1,000 a month. And even now, I still say that I have issues with UBI because I don't think it answers all problems. But I have also been a person who was 100% for tech companies and opportunities created by this. And then the more I thought about it, the more I realized. I may be leading people into a disastrous situation because ultimately, if these companies don't even need people, then why would we be flocking to join a, a tech revolution that is the end of human work as we know it? We talked a little bit about data last week, and we were talking about you know how uh, baby boomers feel versus, um, I guess, millennials about different issues and, and things, and that to admit that our society is changing too rapidly for us to address um, the way we're addressing right now is essentially to admit that the way we've been living for quite a while is wrong. Imagine getting aged out and then the person who aged you out gets automated out. Now is the time for us all to join into the fight against the machines. Not. Let me not say that. Let me not say the fight against machines. We appreciate the machines. They're going to make our lives so much easier, hopefully. But in order for us to embrace the machines, we have to embrace a new way of life. And only Andrew Yang is in a position, is knowledgeable enough, and has policies designed to lead us forward.
So while we're trying to figure out how to get that boomer support, I, I think it's important to start asking the questions about how we got here in the first place. Why didn't we want to just pay a little bit more for our, 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 our goods here in America so they can still be American made? That was a decision that people were on board with. And that is the decision that now we're living with, we're living with the consequences of. Well, that's why I love that Yang never, he never vilifies, you know, successful businesses, successful people. It's all just, look, man, they followed the rules that were put forth. I mean, low key, he's kind of throwing shade on, you know, old establishment and our ability to just sit there and let things be the way they were. Um, government policies like this, where we didn't step in sooner or we shouldn't have stepped in at all. And we created this class and now we're like, oh, they're the problem. Like, no, they just did what they were supposed to do at that time when it was available to do. Yang's the only one. He's the only one. Like, if you can find me another candidate, listen, I'm open. I told y'all at the very beginning, I'm open. But I don't see anybody talking about automation. I don't, I don't see anybody talking about what happens when you give the government too much power. All I see is people who want to give the government everything and they're trying to destroy capitalism. And capitalism is kind of important. It breeds innovation, makes, gives people an incentive to want to push further and make us be competitive. And that's kind of what we need. So I'd love to hear what you guys think in the comment section below. Go ahead. Uh, make sure if you guys are donating to the campaign, use my Act Blue link in the description box. Help me get an opportunity to ask Andrew Yang those, those tough questions face to face on Nerds for Yang. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you give it a like, subscribe for more, and I will see you guys real soon.